Hello, my name's Angela Garbutt and I'm part of the NET English Director team. So welcome to your Route 2 session and this is What the Dickens and its Literature in the Victorian Period. So we're just going to have a, a brief overview of what is Victorian literature. Um, also considering who is the Victorian reader and why is this significant. I also want you to think about um, how Dickens presents drama and humour. Also, why did Victorians enjoy reading about the supernatural and madness? And what are some of the key difficulties and challenges involved in teaching a Victorian text? Victorian literature um, was an insight which allows the reader to appreciate um, a significantly changing world. It was a world of economic movement due to the changes in science and technology and economy. This results in a shift in the social classes too. So Victorian literature followed Romanticism. That was a period of emotional and abstract thinking where writers wanted liberty and they wanted equality for all. Um, yet the realism of life becomes evident when we see a shift from an agricultural society to an industrial society and from a home manufacturing to factory production. The Victorian era spans the duration of Queen Victoria's rule, which was 1837 to 1901. It's characterised by the expanding horizons of education and literacy, as well as the increased desire of the people to question religion and politics. During this time period, publications such as Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto in 1848 and Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859 served as catalysts for political and religious disagreement. These new notions of government and science signalled a turn from the idealism of the Romantics to a more realistic worldview. The Victorian era also marks a time of great economic growth and technological discovery and industrialisation. Many writers reacted to both the wonders of this industrial revolution as well as to the troubles of an industrialised society. Consequently, during the Victorian era, the influence of literature became more prevalent in society as reading evolved into a social pastime indicated by the increasing literacy rate. At the era's beginning, in 1837, it's estimated that approximately half of the male adult population was literate to a certain degree. And because of the new practices, compulsory education and technological advances in printing, resulting in more widely available reading materials, standards of literacy was more or less universal by the end of the century. So looking at our curriculum overview, um, we can see how Victorian literature is embedded right across from year seven to year 11. So we can see initially in term uh, 2A, um, we've got 19th century fiction. So that's our net poetry anthology. So it's also our introduction to that Gothic literature. Moving into um, term 2B, this allows us to look at travel writing. So it's looking from modern day um, non-fiction to 19th century non-fiction. Then moving into year 8, this is when we look at Oliver Twist. And that, that moves seamlessly into um, the 19th century and modern non-fiction through the speeches through ages. Um, and then you can see by the time we move into year 9 in term 3A and 3B, we can um, begin to see um, A Christmas Carol. Um, and we're starting to look at this and to start to look at the overview, the plot and some of the characters. Moving into year 10, in term 1A, we start to develop our understanding, starting to look at um, those key concepts. We also revisit it again in, in year 10, but in term 3B, and we're starting to deepen our understanding. And by the time we get into year 11, term 1A, we're starting to really deepen. So um, we've got a clear overview of this thread of Victorian literature from year 7 to year 11. Also, you'll see um, that I've um, added in when we're looking at English language paper two, because in this um, case, we have we have to compare two texts. Now, one's always 19th century and one's always 21st century. And even though 19th century does exceed the Victorian text because it's 1801 to 1900s, we're able to see how they complement each other. 
um, due to that demise of rural life. The cities are growing rapidly and expanding. There's this long regimented factory hours. Um, so we're starting to see how they link. So the skills that we're learning through our literature, we can bring into our language also. So we can see this continuous thread as it's seen uh, throughout our curriculum as it leads up to year 11 GCSE. Also at the bottom, you'll also see um, three arrows where it leads up to the exam pathway and that's individual for each academy um, to see what's necessary um, for their particular academy, maybe something that needs to be revisited, for example, and it could possibly be um, either a Christmas Carol or the um, unseen non-fiction, as I've already previously mentioned. So Victorians became great readers of the novel and a number of novels were available to them to read and increased enormously during um, Queen Victoria's reign. The activity of reading benefited from the cheapening costs of publication, from the improved distribution that re resulted from better transportation and towards the end of the century from the arrival of gas and electric lighting in homes, which meant that reading after dark no longer had to take place by candlelight or oil lamp. Although fiction was increasingly targeted at specific markets, some works strongly appealed across different classes, different age and different genders. G. H. Wells, who was an English biographer, a literary critic, he was also a novelist, a philosopher and a scientist, noted of Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, 1836 to 1837, that even the common people from both town and country are equally intense in their admiration. Frequently, we have seen the butcher boy with his tray on his shoulder, reading with the greatest avidity the last Pickwick, the footman, the maid servant, the chimney sweep, all classes, in fact, read. How fantastic as a new and exciting reading culture has started to develop. So let's have a little look at how Dickens presents drama and humour in Oliver Twist. So we've just got a couple of examples, but I thought it was worth just skimming over because we do this obviously in, um, we look at this text in year eight. So looking at the personality of Mr. Bumble, he's obviously put in there for this comedic effect. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines Bumble as to move or act in an awkward or puzzled manner, to speak in a confused or indistinct way. Therefore, this image is used to evoke um, a character that's used to be poked fun at, which really juxtaposes his position in the orphanage because he's seen as somebody who has power. Also, when Oliver is told that he is, he is to go to the table and he is go, he's going to go to the um, board, Oliver's ignorance here um, is really defined as when he goes into the room, as Dickens describes, of eight to ten excessively fat men, um, he's told to bow to the board. Yeah, he doesn't see a plank, but he sees a stand and luckily he bowed to that. So Oliver's ignorance is both amusing and, and is, it's really sad as he underpins his vibrant ignorance and its helplessness due to his class. Um, it's quite definitely out of his control though. There are many cases where Dickens juxtaposes formality and ridicule with hostility and rudeness and Dickens is constantly aware of the difference of class and aims to make the readers, which are growing, aware of these differences too. So let's have a little look at how Dickens presents drama and humour in A Christmas Carol. However, I think as we work our way through the next few slides, you'll also see how there are links to the supernatural and to madness, um, and how they correlate throughout the plot. Um, so the novella's full title was A Christmas Carol in Prose, Being a Ghost Story at Christmas. And the fact that Dickens chose to celebrate Christmas with the most unchristian of things, being a ghost story, is exceptionally typical of him. A Christmas Carol, um, there's one self-conscious aside about how we should worship the festival's sacred name and origin, and also a far-fetched assertion that it's good to be a child at Christmas because that's when its mighty founder was a child himself. So this is a novel that begins a journey of self-discovery. The novella's famous first line, Marley was dead to begin with, establishes many things at once. It shocks what many people might expect of the opening paragraph of a Victorian novel in favour of a terse address. It allows Dickens to indulge his love of this topsy-turviness, insisting 
that what it sounds like a story's end is in fact the beginning. It delivers a gentle shock to those readers who might have expected a Christmas story to begin a festive spirit, and it promises supernatural fun because it comes straight after the chapter title Marley's Ghost. And that's a tip, really, that Marley can't quite be as dead as the narrator claims. And although Ebenezer Scrooge is not yet spoken, he chimes in with what we'll soon recognise as the miser's characteristic tone. His insistence that he's continuously right about everything when we know that he's usually mistaken. So in that one line of those six short words, Dickens really encapsulates the tension of the entire story, the tension between that blinkered confidence and the open-eyed modesty. So through the opening line, Dickens really puts um, death predominantly um, at the forefront of the reader's mind. Despite his status um, in his own time and in ours as the ultimate family entertainer, Dickens was really energised by all things grim and gruesome. Um, foulness got him excited and he knew it would also get the reader excited too. A Christmas Carol is quite uneven in its written work. Um, it can be a little bit disjointed and it rushes at some parts. But there's no mistake in Dickens' full engagement when he accompanies Scrooge into a filthy slum crowded with garbage and offal, where dark secrets are bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat and sepulchres of bones. But also note too, remember the, this macabre hilarity. Remember when Marley's ghost takes off the bandage wrapped around his head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. This could easily fit into a horror movie's special effects, um, and it wouldn't look out of um, context there. So this reminds the reader and Scrooge himself of his death. Therefore, his appearance um, seems to be unexpected. So while Dickens is doubtlessly sincere in his disapproval of Scrooge's pessimism, we can sense his wicked glee at Scrooge's declaration that every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in their own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart supports his hatred for mankind, celebration and humility. And we can't possibly forget how Dickens produces this drama and humour in A Christmas Carol when Scrooge um, tries to make light of the first ghost that he meets um, with Marley. Um, and when he states, um, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. So this small joke and the gravity of this situation decreases. Um, these small bits of comedy are often uttered by Scrooge and the narrator and they make the characters seem more endearing in a way. Since Scrooge is not generally a very likeable character, these casual retorts make you like him more. It makes you want to care about Scrooge's morality and his compassion, really, as the novella continues. So the ghosts give the story an irresistible logical structure and make Scrooge think that he's prepared for each succeeding visitation. He's preparing to meet the second of the three spirits and nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. This is from Stave 3. But of course he is surprised. The ghost of Christmas present surprises him by showing him flashes of humour and happiness in the most unlikely of circumstances. And we see this through Bob Cratchit's family, for example. We see this through Fred's family. Um, and when Scrooge sees the visions revealed by the third of the spirits, he naturally fails to recognise what the reader knows from the first, that the dead man abandoned after the scavengers have done with him is actually himself. So Dickens balances out the eerie moments with something that's fascinating. Dickens has this occasional sense of humour that provides relief for the reader in some of the most disturbing and macabre of times. Um, he uses this strategy of comic relief in, in Stave 4 when we've got the old charwoman who sold Scrooge's bed curtains, his blankets and the shirt that he was supposed to be buried in to old Joe the pawnbroker. Um, 
when he states his blankets, asked Joe. Whose else's do you think? replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. So at this point, we can see in the story, The Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come is showing Scrooge um, a scene of thieves overlooking their loot of stolen goods, uh, ones that they had stolen from his dead body. Now, for some, this might be a repulsive thought, but for this small bit of humour ensures that the reader won't become too disgusted with their actions, as Scrooge has inevitably treated them worse than this over time. So on Christmas Eve, the city itself um, is a place full of ghosts um, where it had not been light all day. So outside Scrooge's counting house, the fog is so dense that although the court was of the narrowest and the houses opposite were mere phantoms, the bell in a nearby church tower strikes the hours and quarters as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. So after Marley's ghost has left him, Scrooge looks out of his window and sees the air filled with phantoms, many of them chained souls, once, uh, some of those who had once been friends and business colleagues of Scrooge. Misery will remain in the air unless changes to support the poor are made, so he too will also become a ghost, unable to settle and rest after he dies, unless he changes too. So elsewhere, still Dickens unleashes that powerful speech, as though Marley's ghost was auditioning for a role in Paradise Lost. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. So Dickens has the ability to combine the fear of the spirits and the unknown with the humour of the characters and their class. And this defines Dickens' desire to widen every reader's understanding of Victorian society through literature. So Marley's ghost announces that you will be haunted by three spirits in stay of one. Scrooge is even told at what times they will appear. So the goats really bring that fatality to the narrative and Scrooge can't resist the visions they set before him. He has to work at those times to encounter the world that he's made for himself. So time is built into the narrative, remember the bells, almost like a madness to confuse Scrooge and the reader. The ghosts really have their allotted spans and they must fill in those spans so they can allow Scrooge to change. So my time is nearly gone, says Marley's ghost. My time grows short, observes the first of the three spirits. Quick, says the second spirit. So chronology is of the essence. So Christmas is a special day made all the more significant by the unfolding of these visions um, at each hour. So on Christmas Eve, Marley's ghost tells Scrooge of the three visits in three consecutive nights, but he wakes to find it is Christmas Day. The spirits have done it all in one night, which means that he has experienced three journeys in one evening, allowing him to redeem himself. I think you've probably seen when we've looked through the drama and humour, we've seen a lot of supernatural and that confusion which really links to madness. But we can see that this is um, a time of growing psychological intrigue. There's no doubt that Victorians had a deep fascination with the supernatural. The supernatural was not merely a form of entertainment, of chilling ghost stories before bedtime, but it's an important aspect of the Victorians' intellectual, spiritual, emotional and imaginative worlds, and it took place in the domestic centre of their everyday lives. The supernatural had influence over literature and it was led to the complex genre of the Victorian's ghost story. While there was a typical ghost story may seem simple in its purpose and delivery, the Victorian ghost story operated really on two levels. It was entertainment and it had a cultural commentary. The Victorian ghost story was largely domestic in nature, often set aside in the home. An example of social issues addressed by Gothic texts can be seen in A Christmas Carol, which utilises the ghost story in order to comment on the struggle of the lower classes who were hidden in a helpless position in Victorian culture. Um, they're also directing the sympathies onto the plight of the poor, who seem to be irrelevant to the middle and the upper classes, even though they underpin their ability to remain in those privileged classes. So briefly just outlining 
some of the key difficulties and challenges involved in teaching a Victorian text. It could be that the fact of the length of the Victorian novel or poem, it's often quite exhausting for a 21st century student. Um, and this is why begins, we begin to study it in year seven so that students can see those threads of concepts such as love, relationship, power and conflict throughout um, their learning um, as these often overlap within different texts leading up to GCSE. Also, an author often extends their description to provide a wealth of detail. Yet as a teenager, this can often be seen as irrelevant. I could even say boring unless it's really delved into so we can have that deepening of understanding. As I've already said, those key contextual aspects of economy, industrialization and class um, are vital for students who are able to grasp these. Um, and if they're able to do this in year seven, they can easily take them through their learning journey, um, which will also work hand in hand with their key concepts. So being able to refer to the context, whether or not it's historical or cultural, it's vital, therefore, for that factual material from the period of this period of time. Um, it's almost like we're going back and we're going through a time traveling journey. So students um, could be invited to consider how they're reading these literary texts in relation to the contextual information um, and the importance of this kind of narrative. It's almost like a painting. Um, it's vital, but it can only be achieved through this well-planned curriculum over time and the lessons that spark the students. And we can see on the slide in front of you how we're linking from year seven to year eight and to year nine and beyond. Again, this is in your curriculum um, overview as well. So thank you for listening. And if you've got any queries or you'd like some further information, please don't hesitate to drop me an email. Thank you very much.